and you should probably see a little dot that says recording. So, um, and um, really, I want to focus on, you know, self confidence and confidence. So this has really been a project about how to help children gain self confidence. Um, and we seem to have quite a crisis of that, um, especially in our community, if not in, in a much bigger scale. And that this has kind of come about from interviewing the parents who've come into our martial arts school when we've been out to the schools and talked with, with the kids about bullying. And uh, we've done a lot in the community, and this seems to be more the root of most, pe most parents' concerns that we've uh, kind of come up with. And kind of started us on this project of how can we help kids develop more self-confidence? And can we come up with a model that actually works for their parents to help them, their teachers to help them? And we do this in martial arts all the time, but martial arts isn't exactly really mainstream, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, it kind of set me off on a, a path to, to try and take – self-confidence and try and apply like a psychological model, a sports model and other things to this to see if we come up with a really simple way uh, to impart this on people. And uh, that kind of led me, I'll just give you a little bit of backstory, led me to a gentleman named Michael Gervais, who is the sports psychologist for like Seattle Seahawks. Um, you're probably familiar with Felix Bumgarner, the guy that jumped out of the, yeah. Michael Gervais helped him mentally train for that, uh, as well as a number of other people. As a matter of fact, I know one of the flight surgeons on that team. Oh, wow. Uh, Jonathan Clark, but he lost his wife on Columbia. Oh. The Marine, medically, Navy trained flight surgeon doctor. Uh, but yeah, so it was kind of interesting. So I have a little bit of a perspective on that jump from John as well. Sure. And that's awesome. And that led me to start thinking, um, to start questioning how do people with really unique skills develop their self-confidence? And really importantly, how do they, I, was, I went on a quest kind of to find people who not only had that use unique skills, but also were in the habit of teaching others. Um, and so I, have interviewed several several people from the world power breaking champion to uh, special forces medic to survival primitive skills survival specialist to uh, different people and I was literally sitting here at my desk and I thought geez I literally said the words out loud who's got out of this world self-confidence and I thought an astronaut <laughs> Then I realized that I don't know any astronauts, <laughs> and nor do I know how to contact one. So that set me on a quest. And and Mark, who you know, is my, uh, I don't know if you've talked about this, but he's my son's Lego robotics coach. Yeah. And um, so that's how I kind of came to you. <laughs> yeah. It's been fun following your son's team, right? And that's really impressive. Yeah, they, they had a great time, and it was a great experience. And uh I'm hoping he does it again. I don't know if he's going to, but <laughs> we're encouraging him. Did your son go to Houston with the club? Yes. Yeah. Any possibility you could scoot closer to the microphone? I, I can't quite hear you. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Is that better? It is, but now I don't see you very well. <laughs> Can you tilt your screen up a little bit? <laughs> I hate to be in that. There we go. That's awesome. So yeah, it's interesting the camera's in the bottom, at the bottom of the screen on this laptop instead of the top of it. Oh, wow. Which gives you an interesting perspective, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Actually. So I, I have, uh, you know, eight, 10 questions about confidence and, and, and you, and, and I, I, I couldn't get on an interview without at least a couple of space questions. <laughs> So, um, do you have any questions for me? Is there anything that, uh, you know, maybe Mark told you that I could clear up or? No, the, uh, you know, the first thing is thank you for what you're doing. What, what a great cause. And so I'm very supportive of what it is you're doing. 
And, uh, yeah, and so I probably have a couple different perspectives for you because as a kid growing up, I was a scrawny little kid, not particularly coordinated, uh, not a particularly gifted athlete uh, in school, high school. So I've kind of seen both sides. And as a matter of fact, as a young, oh, maybe seventh, eighth grader, uh, wound up taking some judo lessons, uh, went to a meet, just got pounded. Uh, however, you know, I did have other opportunities with those judo skills where I was like, well, hey, it was kind of nice to have this. Uh, but, so I can relate to kids, you know, that, don't have a huge amount of self-confidence in, you know, what I believe is important. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, um, as a Navy fighter pilot, uh, I did well. Right? When, you, when you do well at something, then you start getting confidence. And as an right. astronaut, it's the same thing. And so, so I kind of have views from both worlds, if you will. Excellent. Well, let's, that's a couple questions down on my list, but let's just jump in there if that's okay. Sure. Um, when did you determine that you had some special skills or gifts towards, uh, I don't know whether it'd be more accurate to say flying because you've got an extensive flying career or science or did it all come together at once or? Yeah. So in school, uh, I did well, but by no means the top of the class, right? Not the valedictorian or that sort of thing. I worked and was a B plus, A, B's and A's kind of student. Mm -hmm. So school was fine. I grew up in a very small town, a town of about 1,400 folks. So my graduating class was about 50. Uh, I, I'm with you. I graduated with 62 people. You did? Little you did. country town, yep. Where? Chimicum, Washington. Oh, okay. Neat. Yeah, so I was in southern Colorado, but uh, so in school, School, uh, I did have an experience where I, I liked basketball and I was okay. And on our freshman team, uh, it, you know, they would rotate the captain, but but I, I could shoot the ball well. I wasn't very good at dribbling, but anyway, I, I was good enough to play. Uh, when I became a 10th grader, uh, the, the high school coach had come back to town he had left previously and run up bills and my father had a business there. And so as he was trying to leave town early in the morning, my dad showed up with a, an order, a court order and the cops and confiscated some of his stuff. So needless to say, when he came back, he was not a fan of my family. And out of the entire basketball team, he cut one kid off the team the 10th year as a 10th grader. And it was me. Of course. And it actually, although I was, you know, I had all kinds of mixed emotions, embarrassed because I was the only kid cut, then just kind of really mad because I, I felt like I'd been mistreated. Kind of, be, you know, wanted to come become a bit of a rebel in our neighboring town, which was a big rival. Uh, that when my mom was a school teacher, offered me, hey, you can come to school here. We'd love to have you. I played the drums in a band, and they said, hey, we'd love to have you. And, but I couldn't do that. But I just, to me, that being loyal to my high school. Um, but it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I, I, in my little town in Southern Colorado, we were lived near a ski area, but you couldn't play sports and ski. They didn't allow you to snow ski. So, so well, since I can't play basketball, I took up snow skiing and, and actually loved it and uh, became a ski patrol today. I love it. But it's one of the, one of the sports I really love in a, and initially, I had to work really hard, but eventually, I, I did become one of those skiers where, you know, double black diamond, hello skiing, unless it's a really big cliff, I pretty much can figure out how to get off it okay. Uh, so, so I started down another path. It's kind of insane with riding a dirt bike. I've always loved speed and acceleration. So I took up dirt biking and started doing different races and, and had success. And so that success just led me to believe, hey, I don't have to be like my buddy who in high school was, you know, the head boy, the head of the student council. He was a team captain of football, basketball. Track. He, was, he was a gifted athlete, which was not me. Uh, and we were good friends. But, you know, one time I was thinking, hey, I should 
be more like him. But at some point I realized, hey, no, we're all given a set of tools. Right? We all have attributes and some folks have more attributes than others, but we all have those areas that we are either gifted at or we have a passion for. Mm -hmm. one, right? Some people have a gift and they're not passionate for it. So, hey, they need my philosophy and what I tell kids, follow your passion. And at the same time, if you're in a group and you know, hey, you're not nearly as gifted or good as those others that you're with, don't let that bother you. Just do your best, do your thing, be who you are. Be who you are. And there's a lot of times where maybe it's not all that comfortable. That's okay. Because as you, as you go through life, there will be times where your mix fits really well. So don't think you have to be like other folks, right? Just don't, don't ever succumb, just kind of hang around. So, you know, in high school, I, I kind of did, I kind of, my, I was kind of always a slow starter. I didn't really care about the limelight that much. And, and kind of what I realized was by the end of my high school year, I was the one that I, I'd learned how to repel. So I got a rope and a rappel. And so, you know, I remember one day with students in my class that had never dished a day of school in their life. So the valedictorian, the salutatorian, both girls, and some of my friends, I said, hey, you all need to go learn how to repel. I said, well, we ought to do it next Thursday afternoon. Boy, we have school. I go, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, another story is my mom was a teacher. My senior year, I went to her and said, hey, mom, if I keep my school grades up, can I take off every Wednesday and go snow skiing? And I go, by the way, at our school, we were allowed 12 excused absences if you're sick or whatever, right? And, and once you've used the 12, then there's no more excused. But I said, Is, however many I have, can I use them to go snow skiing if I promise you I'll keep my grades up? And uh, she goes, oh, you know, we need to talk to your dad. I said, I know, I came to you first. And, uh, so anyway, we, we did. And the end result was they said yes. So two of my best friends, you know, another one that we were ski patrol together, I went to them and said, hey, go tell your folks, my folks are allowing me to go ski on Wednesday afternoon uh, as long as I keep my grades up. And so anyway, they did. So, you know, it was so cool. And we would travel, you know, a couple hours to bigger ski areas that we didn't normally get to ski. You know, my grades were absolutely the best those quarters because – First of all, I felt a little bit guilty about not being in school. So I worked that much harder. Sure. And I also felt really good about kind of starting this private ski club. Uh, and, you know, that, so that was one of the things I did. The other one, they took everybody repelling on an off school day. We had the best time, right? And so I kind of then was, you know, teaching the, my classmates different things. But mm -hmm. we just had so much fun at an outing and they were like, eight or nine of us, which was, that was, you know, a pretty big percentage of our class. And uh, so, yeah, so by the end of my senior year, I felt really good about me because I was contributing, I thought, to the group, to the class. I was developing skills. I loved, the, you know, what I was doing with the snow skiing and the dirt biking. Uh, and so it, it's kind of like I just, Stuck with who I was, and it started working out. And uh, so, really? so I wanted to fly. Anyway, no, go ahead. No, so really from 10, I'm taking notes. So I'm, I'm not texting anybody. I'm taking notes as this is recording as well. So really, it was kind of a two-year span for you from sophomore, junior, or, or somewhere in the sophomore year, junior, senior year, where you really came into your own or feel like you came into your own? Yeah. And, you know, my that sophomore year when I got cut, you know, I could have gone down to just being a total rebel, a victim, right? An angry victim. Hey, I was mistreated. And, and I realized, hey, you need to get over it. Right? You just need to get past that. And so your story is like many other people's that I've interviewed. Mine, that's like a, I don't know if I could speak clearly, a switch that flipped for you, essentially. That negative incident actually turned the switch to be the most positive thing that could happen. Yeah, yes. So it, it's one of those things where it made me kind of try to sit down and 
figure out what it was I wanted to do. And I didn't get there right away, right? And, uh, sure. But that coach, you know, I, I resented for quite a while who did that. But, you know, after a while, it's, it's so interesting. You know, you want to be mean back to them. And then you realize, no, hey, don't get pulled down to the level. And that's what you do, even today, right? Even today, there are certain times where somebody, you know, is hitting below the belt. And, I, and I, my folks that work for me and even, you know, same, I, I led the astronaut office for four years as a chief astronaut. And I'd always say, do not get sucked into their fight, right? You do not go down there. Just stay on the high road. And sometimes it's kind of hard because you, you, you want to, you know, kind of punch back. But I'm like, no, nah, hey, you know, just stay on the high road. And, uh, and things work out so much better. Yeah. So how did you transition, you know, dirt bikes and repelling? Those are kind of outdoor sports, obviously. What was the transition for flying and really for science? Because you must have a deep love for science in there somewhere. So, yeah, so I, I went to college. And, and when I was in high school, then I decided I wanted to be an airline pilot. My father got his license when I was about seven years old. And I loved it. I loved the flying. And I thought, man, I want to be an airline pilot. It looks like a good job. They get paid well. And so I got my pilot's license when I was in college. And my dad had a small plane. And then, you know, I started realizing anything that had acceleration, I loved. Right? So like dirt bike, mogul skiing, uh, flying, that's a lot of acceleration. And so I actually then took the initiative to go talk to the airlines that were in Denver. So back then it was like TWA, United, I think Pan Am was still on. And I went and talked to like three or four of them. I drove down there. And the first thing was I was amazed that they were willing to, you know, let me come in and sit down with their chief pilot or somebody in the, you know, so today too, right? If, if a student asks me to do something, I will bend over backwards for them. Way more than if some adult wants me to go do something. And, uh, sure. So, yeah. Uh, case in point with the robotics team, right? I don't many times offer up my friends in Houston who are still in the office. So one of my friends is the chief astronaut now. But for Mark Snoffer and his Lego kids, I go, yeah, hey, I'll do that. Right? I don't ask for the – I just hate asking for favors like that. Sure. For them, I'll do it. For a group of adults, I'm much less likely to do that. Uh, so, so anyway, as a kid, I went down and pretty much all the airlines said the same thing. Hey, you need to get flight time. And unless you have a lot of money, the best way to get flight time is join the military. Well, I was in college 74 to 78. So Vietnam had just wound down. I had long hair. I did not want to cut my hair. I didn't think I would like the military. So I didn't join the military until... Finally, Navy recruiters showed up on site and took a friend of mine flying, and he came back and was just talking about doing all these great aerobatics, you know, T-34, and I said, well, I have two questions. What's a T-34? <laughs> Two-seat airplane. And, and then my second question was, how much does it cost? I said, free, you just have to take a test. I go, well, I can take a test. So anyway, I, I did, you know, I had very self selfish motives to go just get to do aerobatics in a T-34. Sure. Uh, but it made me think, and I go, yeah, you know, I really do want to fly. So I, I looked into the services, and the Navy was the best fit for me, and I found a guarantee. Uh, so I joined the Navy. It was scary. I was scared to death joining the military. And, yeah, so then aviation, particularly as a fighter pilot, I, I had a gift. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, so much so that at some point I was I was overconfident and you know somewhat obnoxious at times. And in a, as a younger pilot, I had a really really good commanding officer. He would he'd been the commanding officer of Top Gun. He was known as the best pilot on the base. I learned so much from him. Uh, when he left, uh, the next commanding officer was not a gifted pilot. And, and I was having a hard time dealing with that for a guy that I didn't really respect that much. Mm -hmm. I didn't support him well. And on, on one of my evaluations at the end of the year, and by the way, they, they rank you. It, it, back then in the Navy, you got ranked. So if there were 12 of us pilots, you knew if you were number one, you knew if you were 12, you know, 
and when I went in to be debriefed, he he his re, uh, my respect for him skyrocketed because he sat down with me and said, "Hey, you know, Rommel was my call sign." He goes, "You know, Rommel, uh, you got ranked here, which was high." Uh, he goes, "Even though I didn't want to rank you there, you you haven't been all that supportive of me, and so you got this ranking because you know other guys." And between him and me, have done that. And he said, "And you're you're flying. Your record, you deserve that." But you haven't really supported me like you should. And my respect went from I, I hadn't really respected the guy. He wasn't a particularly gifted leader either. Mm-hmm. But when he said that, I just went, "Oh my God, he's right. He's right." And he's calling me out. And so from that day on which was back in about 1983. I've always remembered that. And from that time on, I really realized, hey, no matter what you think of the person you're working for, you need to give them the best. And you need to not you know, talk about hey, the problems they have as a leader, as a pilot or whatever. That didn't do anybody any good at all, right? So I've really tried since then to not fall in the trap of complaining about some guy that I, some person that I don't think is doing what, how they should be. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of, you know, in the movie Top Gun, they show you a couple of, of fighter pilots that were just kind of jerks. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I learned being a fighter pilot, or for the most part, the ones that are jerks, uh, they're not the most gifted fighter pilots, right? They're the ones that really want to be, but they're, they're not. And a lot of times the ones that are more quiet and unassuming are the ones that really know what's going on and gifted. And, and you see that out in the industry as well. So, so yeah, so confidence, right? So you probably have kids that I would guess come in, you know, in a boy, as they develop their skills, some of them can fall into the trap of, of believing the headlines that they read. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, you know, eventually they'll figure out, hey, you know what? I shouldn't act like I am the greatest gift to whatever. And, uh, you know, when I look at folks and athletes out there that do so well, I really appreci- appreciate humility, those that are humble. Right? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, uh, to your point, you know, we'll get, we've got several people that have, young people that have been with us from five, six, seven years old and are now 17, 18, 19 years old. And they go through the same stages as every other teenager where they get kind of full of themselves like we all do. And, but what we found is they just pull out of it faster. When they have a tight group of peers that are all on the same path and they're working towards the same goal and they've got good role models, um, yeah, they go through the up and downs, but there's, they go for a lot shorter period of time. It's like they got to experiment, but then they go, yeah, this isn't right. This doesn't fit. Right. And so they kind of, they kind of rein themselves back in quickly. And so. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so part of growing up, you do, you go through these. Yeah. These where, hey, you think. So, yeah. Can, can I go back to, uh, you said you were really scared to join the Navy, but it was the best fit for you. Why do you feel like the Navy was the best fit? And I guess what was the, I mean, if you were scared, what made you do it? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I was scared because I didn't know much about the military, being in, in Colorado, rural Colorado. I didn't think I would like the people. I kind of stereotyped the military as uh, not cool, you know, in, in simple sense. And when I joined, I actually wasn't obligated. So the Navy... The Navy has always had a retention problem for pilots because you, for the most part, you get deployed on a ship on an aircraft carrier and sent away for six months. And it is a hardship. Sure. So, so, you know, those that have families, typically a lot of those pilots decide to do something else where they don't have to leave their families for six plus months at a time. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Air Force, where the Air Force, their retention is much better. And so the Navy had a program where I wasn't guaranteed until I finished flight school. When I talked to the Air Force, no, I was—I had to be there. I was signed up and obligated from day one. 
But I also, when I started looking into it more, first of all, the Navy recruiter was a really cool guy. Uh, second of all, what, what I found out was the Navy kind of had fewer rules and it was like more of a, when you deploy on a ship, you're given a lot of responsibility early on mm. as a leader and a pilot because it, they're, they're, everything's limited on the ship. Sure. When Air Force, they're more rule oriented and you, you stay in a pretty rigorous pattern as a younger guy. Uh, in, in the Air Force, in Navy's philosophy is kind of like, if you don't know if it's right or wrong, don't ask any questions, do what you think's right. In the Air Force, it's more of, no, no, hey, you need to ask to see if it's right or wrong. And a lot of times you'll get told no just because nobody knows. Whereas in the Navy, it's like, hey, go for it. And if it doesn't work out, well, then you'd rather ask for forgiveness. Uh, okay. So, so there still is, you know, some of that mentality. And, uh, and I also, I love the idea of flying on and off an aircraft carrier. I mean, so. And how, how did Top Gun come about? Now, in the movies, of course, and not being a naval fighter pilot, um, it, it looks like, you know, they pick the best person from several places around the world, then they'd let you go. Is that how it really worked? Or how did you get into that? So, yeah, your squadron, every squadron's given a probably a one slot per year to send a pilot to. So the, the slots are very highly coveted. Okay. And, uh, so yeah, so I got chosen to go through, uh, I, I did go through, loved it. Interestingly, Top Gun spends a lot of time early on talking to you about how to be an instructor. And a lot of what, instructor? how to be an instructor. Because the idea is, yeah, they're training you uh, to be a good fighter pilot, but they want, but then the expectation is you go back to your squadron and you pass on those skills, you train your squadron. So top young graduates that are expected to raise the level of proficiency in that fighter squadron. So they teach you to, when you're out dogfighting, and they'll say, okay, if you're in an F 14, which is what I flew, and you're fighting an F 16, you know, with the engagement, if you're beating the F 16, and when you come back to debrief, you don't go, hey, you know, I got behind you, I shot you, I killed you dead. No, no. They go, try to make whoever it is you're teaching as willing to want to learn from you as possible. Knowing that, hey, once you beat them, you know, you feel a bit humiliated, your defensive mechanisms kick in. So don't, you, you do not want to be a jerk. You want them to want to know what you know. So when you come back, go, Hey, at this point, the F-14 lined up getting an opportunity to fire a shot at the F-16, and, and that's it. And so on one of my first engagements, I, I went out. Actually, it was my very first flight in Top Gun. I'm fighting a Marine major, and he is way winning, right? He is getting behind me, and he knocks the, the fight off. And I, and I immediately assume, I go, you know, he must either have a, he's got a problem with his airplane because he shouldn't be out of fuel yet. He knocked it off, and I was waiting to hear, okay, we got to return to base. He has a problem, but he didn't. So we set up for another engagement, and another, and another. And uh, when we came back in the debrief, I said, hey, Willie, why did you knock off that first engagement? He said, because the learning objectives were met. He goes, I think we both knew how it was going to turn out. So the, rather than taking me to the point where I was shot and I was dead, he goes, we didn't need to do that. Let's save the gas and set up again because we both know. And for me, you know, the, the first thing any of your buddies ask is, hey, did you get shot? I could go, no, right? <laughs> Although in my case, I went, no, but only because Willie's an awesome guy and he knocked it off, right? right. But that whole mentality that Top Gun teaches, and they, to the point where they go, hey, in your uniform, if you're briefing, take all your ribbons off. Don't make them a distraction at all. Don't make it look like, hey, you're some kind of proficient guy. You, you really want them to want to learn, which is not in the movie at all. Right. Um, so, yeah, and, then, and after Top Gun, they write down on a list who they would have, like to have come back as an instructor. And, you know, they only have about 10-ish instructors, junior officers. So it, it's a really tough list to break out on uh, but but that's what you want and so 
they want the folks that will be good instructors, which aren't necessarily the most gifted pilots. Uh, you know, ideally they get a combination of a, a gifted pilot and just a really good instructor. But uh, so yeah, so so Top Gun, you know, really started me thinking about yeah, you know, I want the folks in the squadron to want to fly with me. I want them to want to know what I know. And so, so I did. I carried a lot of that back. And uh, with the wingman that I trained. I worked really hard to to make them better, but, but never never humiliate them. Uh, that, that's excellent because that kind of leads into my question of uh, do they or do you have a system to help people become more teachable? Like you, you alluded to the point very well that they didn't humiliate you. You worked very hard not to humiliate them. That's a big deal, obviously. Um, was was there kind of a system in place or uh, maybe it wasn't like a written thing, but just everybody understood, the best people understood how to get the best out of the next person? And if so, can you kind of outline that a little bit? Yeah, so. Hope that made sense. <laughs> no, no, I, I get what you're saying. And there, there was no, hey, here's how to do the best. And with pilots, you know, they all have different aptitudes. So mm -hmm. one of my wingmen, really neat guy he he was not all that aggressive in an airplane so i would i would kind of bait him and, and let him get behind me get a really offensive start to hope the aggressive aggressiveness would kick in and he would really go after it uh i had limited success i had other pilots younger that were were kind of were aggressive right and so it was really fun watching them, bringing them along. And with those guys, I wouldn't give them that much rope because you know I, I wouldn't be able to recover from it. Right. Uh, I had one younger officer, a matter of fact, his last name's Poindexter. His father was Admiral Poindexter way back in the Iran-Contra affair where Ollie North and Admiral Poindexter were under President Reagan. Uh -huh. The fall for Iran where there were weapons being transferred. Uh, anyway, this is that guy's son, and uh, Alan, he, he was a wingman and got, he was gifted. And so he showed up as a really gifted, brand new pilot, so gifted we put him with a, a young backseater. Uh, and then it, then it all went to his head. And then all of a sudden he, he was Mr. Know-it-all uh, and he, he stopped learning. And a matter of fact, he even went backwards because he thought he knew everything. And so him, I was hard on, right? So him, I would, I would just hammer. I would just come back and sure. all trying to get through to Dex. And, uh, you know, and matter of fact, one time I was so hard on him, he, he stormed out of the debriefing room almost in tears because uh, I didn't feel like he was really listening or getting it. So I, I was just really hard. I, I rarely, it, well, he's the only guy I ever did that to. It, it worked. He showed up at NASA as an astronaut, uh, you know, about four years later. And I followed up. I followed up with him on the squadron too. And they go, "Hey, he's really come around." You know, he didn't do it when I was there. Our our, our period of overlap was about a yearish or so, and it was you know midway through that where I started being hard. So with him, I was I was really hard. I was very different than any other wingman, and, and I find. With me, I'm particularly hard on those where I see a lot of potential. And particularly if I don't think the potential is being utilized, I'm hard on them. If it's folks where, hey, they're they're working their darndest, but they, you know, but their their potential is limited. I try to help, but I don't want them to feel bad, right? I don't want it to be a miserable experience. Sure. So, so I'm very much in a, anyway. My sense is I had good, uh, I think people appreciated how I treated them uh, for the most part, even though I treated folks differently. Right. That was, that was kind of where, I, from everything I hear, you, you don't, you're, you sound like me or I sound like you and the fact that don't treat everybody the same, treat them based on where they are so you can get them to the next level. Right. right? Yeah. Take that, take where they're existing, evaluate that and then move them forward. And if that means taking them back a little bit, then take them back. <laughs> right. right, so in the Ashdown office, 
uh, I had different leadership positions. And one of them, same thing, younger astronaut had a reputation of people didn't like being on his team, didn't like working with him too much. Pretty intelligent guy, uh, actually very intelligent, but but quick to point out uh, problems with, with other folks or quick to cut him off if he had the answer and not really let the team totally function. And so with him, I, I pulled him in and, and just talked to him about it and said, hey, look, uh, here's, here is how you are perceived. And, so, and, I, and I would kind of use the we. So we need to change it because because I know I, I know what you can do and I know your capabilities and so right. so in the future work hard you know to bite your tongue right when, when let the team maybe struggle through things a little bit more if they get it go good and I said the other thing is his name was Steve I go Steve nobody doubts that you are really technical capable uh, but you will be more valued on the team by letting the team develop more, or even if it's just one other person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in, in any way, you know, after I did this, you can always wonder, I go, yeah, I wonder if Steve's ever going to come back and talk to me again, because I, I told him things he probably hadn't heard before. Although I don't think he was surprised, but he did. He, he came back and even today in industry, he's, He's with Lockheed Martin. I'm with Northrop Gumman. You know, I, I I hear feedback from folks at Lockheed where Steve really appreciated uh, how I treated him and what I did. So, awesome. uh, yeah, excellent. Um, how did what made you determine? I've got a. I want to get to how you got to NASA and then a few other questions here. How, what made you decide to go being a pilot? Just and sound like you really loved it. It, was it the fascination with more speed? Because it doesn't get much faster than a rocket, I'm sure. <laughs> so, or what was it? Yeah, so because people say, hey, did you always want to be an astronaut? I'm like, no. I mean, I always thought it was cool, but not for a million years did I think as a young kid growing up, I could really be an astronaut, right? And so once I became a fighter pilot, you know, there was a Navy test pilot that came out and talk to our squadron about, hey, you guys might want to think about being test pilots. And by the way, test pilots, all the early astronauts were test pilots. I went, wow, I didn't even know that, right? I mean, so uh, that made me start thinking. And, and yeah, I've never found anything yet that's had enough power. Right? I, <laughs> I've never been in or on anything yet that I felt like it's had enough power. I, I love power and acceleration. So. So I, I looked into that. Okay, what does it take to be an astronaut? Well, for, for pilots, you have to be a test pilot. To be competitive, you probably need at least a master's degree. So I did, I got a master's in aeronautical engineering uh, and applied to test pilot school. And so went to test pilot school. And the reality of it is, I was also offered a job at Top Gun. And so I was kind of secretly, secretly wishing that I wouldn't get into test pilot school because being an instructor at Top Gun is just looks like the most fun, rewarding job in the Navy. And they get to fly multiple different airplanes every day at dogfighting and teaching, you know, working with students that really want to learn. And, you, you, you know, I would imagine you feel really good at the end of the class going, wow, look at look what we did with these pilots that came in average. And now they're leaving with a lot better skill set. Mm -hmm. So I so I kind of secretly wanted to do that, but but I didn't. I got selected for the Navy's test pilot school, and they had a cooperative program where they sent you to their, their graduate school in Monterey, California, for a year, and it was called a cooperative. But I wound up with an aeronautical engineering master's, and, and thankfully in college, I, you know, you know, I tell kids too, hey, you may think grades don't matter, and you're going to go do whatever, but they do. Like the, the, they do matter. You don't need, need to be obsessive about it, but you just need to do your best and don't, because, you know, I knew I was going in the Navy my, during my senior year and I could have just gone, hey, I don't care. I don't need to study. You know, I got my life planned out, but, but no, it matters. I didn't, you kind of owe it to yourself anyway. Sure. Yeah. So once I saw that I applied, uh, I got 
selected for an interview. There weren't many Navy guys that particular year that got selected for an interview, you know, maybe eight of us. They typically would pick six pilots, three-ish, about two Navy, one Marine, three Air Force. And so I kind of looked around and, and out of the test center, I knew that I had gotten a really strong recommendation from the, from the Admiral on the base. So I actually looked around and said, hey, you know, I, my chances are not too bad at this point, right? By the time I'd made it through all the other wickets and, and went down and interviewed and I thought it went well. And uh, I, I, I was in the first group that interviewed at the social near at the end of the week after interview and the head of the board came up and one of the astronauts I knew he'd been an instructor of mine in test pilot school who was there now and, and the head came up and said hey Ken what do you think is this guy a keeper and Ken says hey he's definitely a keeper and in my mind I'm going I can't believe I just heard that because I don't think the head of the board would be saying something like that if he didn't also kind of think that way Right. Uh, so anyway, and, and so I, I think now, and by the way, I didn't get selected. It was devastating. Uh, you can get your results back. And I was close, but I didn't make it. And they only actually selected one Navy pilot that year. Uh, but I think at the end of that first week, that's what the guy was thinking, right? So, but by the time they had interviewed six other classes or six classes total, I didn't make the cut. And, uh, so anyway, when I got the letter, I couldn't believe how badly it hurt. And, and not that I was expecting it, but I just, I wasn't prepared for how badly that hurt. Because I, I really, really wanted, and I thought that was, those were my best chances. Because after that, I left the test center, I went back to the regular Navy, and I figured, hey, I'm not going to look as good now. Uh, I'm not going to have some of the endorsements from the folks at the test center that I'd had before. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it actually, when I came home for that interview, my wife said, hey, how'd it go? I go, yeah, it went great. You know, I feel really good about everything. And so anyway, two years later, I got interviewed. And I went back down with a different perspective. In the interview, I got asked a couple of questions that I couldn't answer. And, uh, and uh, matter of fact, when they asked me the question, I, I looked at the guy, the lead guy asking me, and I thought, I was waiting for him to make a smile. Like, hey, I'm kidding. But, but he wasn't. He was serious. And he asked me, Hey, so in the U.S., and keep in mind, this was back in 1992. Uh, it's interesting. He goes, hey, so we have neighbors. We have Canada to the north, Mexico to the south. What sort of policies of a nation? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My wife is... We plan for this contingency just in case. <laughs> oh, they should be good now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So no. I asked you about Canada and the and Mexico. Yeah, yeah. What policies did we put in place? And I said, you know, once I realized he was serious, because I've been through an interview process before and I didn't get asked this anything like this. And so but but they do tend to, hey, they'll just ask you something off the wall to see how you react. And, I said, well, I said, you know, with Mexico, I think there's a lot of opportunity that could be a win-win because, uh, by the way, at that time, Buchanan was talking about putting up a fence to isolate the countries. You know, it's how ironic, right, with what we're going through now. And I said, I said, I don't agree with that. I think there could be a win-win because of the inexpensive labor in Mexico and the technology and the manufacturing capabilities that we have that we need we could partner to do things with Mexico that could benefit both of us. <laughs> and, and I said, for Canada? I said, I don't know. I, I, I've got to go do some research. But I go, I really don't have a good answer for you with Canada. And, and, and then walking out of the interview, they also said, hey, well, if you don't get selected, what are you going to do? I said, I said, man, I'm going to continue in the Navy. I... Uh, I'm going to try to become a CO. I'd love to be a uh, CO of an aircraft carrier and even an admiral someday. So that's, that's where I'm going to be. And, uh, and I'd always been told before, and you always want to say, but I'll apply again, right? 
they want to see that it's important enough for you that you'll persevere. And I didn't say that. I didn't even think about that. Right? I was just being me. And when I walked out of the room, I went, oh my God, I am such an idiot. First of all, I didn't tell them I would apply again. So they, they, they probably don't think it's that important to me. And I go, second of all, I told them, I don't know. You never tell somebody, I don't know an interview. I go, I am such an idiot. Uh, but you know, the, the reality of it is I was kind of being me. Uh, and I, I think, I think they appreciated that. Right. So, so anyway, I, I did get selected that year. And so I can only imagine that you get, you go from being a test pilot. Now you've got to learn how to do everything in space and you've got to learn these skills. Do you have a process for yourself that you go through that, um, you know how you learn best uh, or because a lot of this has got to be foreign. I'm not sure they're going to give you great training, but do you have a process that you have for yourself to learn something or do you simply follow really well what they taught you or kind of a combination? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. As a matter of fact, even in college, you know, I recognized strengths, and I, you know, and by the way, in the Navy and NASA, we, we were so team oriented. Uh, is on a, the commander of a space shuttle crew or the chief of the astronaut office, I would select the crew. So you want to make sure you put the, the right strengths, the right aptitudes, the skills, or in the crew makeup. And, but you, you don't want to, you know, if you, you can have too many skills and the crew actually won't be as good as if you have a, a, a right combination of such. So same with me personally, right? There are certain things that, I learn well, but the hands-on, the flying, the simulators, learning those systems, uh, some of them, uh, the, the computer systems were, did not come easy for me. So I knew I had to spend extra time. I would maybe, uh, actually a lot of the times I would find somebody that knew that well. And I could just ask my questions so that how my brain processes the, the things in logic I could ask them to them in those kinds of perspectives and, and, and get the kind of answers. And uh, a matter of fact, uh, what am I? They have these cue cards for the computer system on the space shuttle and, and it adds so many pitfalls that you could fall into where you would be in a bad way, which is code for you'd kill yourself <laughs> in the real system. And there's these cards and, and I, these cards is just so piss me off because if you followed it exactly, you'd kill yourself. And then if, if you didn't follow it exactly, you could kill yourself. So it was kind of just a guide, but the, the training team, the instructors who are really smart engineers, you know, when, when I'd kill myself because I either did or didn't follow the card, they go, hey, well, did you follow that card? And then they go, yeah, I followed the damn card. And here's what it says and here's what I did. But but in this circumstance, you can't do that. You have to do this. And so it became kind of a joke. So when I would get in the simulator after a while, after I learned it, I'd, I'd find that card and I would just throw it to the back of the space shuttle and go, okay. Because <laughs> I knew what it said, but I knew I had to really know the system to do it. Right. So kind of, I was a bit of a rebel. And so before I launched on that, the first time I was a commander, they, they printed out about, 500 of those cards and put them everywhere, stacked them. When I launched in space, they had them hidden in all the different books and stuff we had. <laughs> they didn't want you to forget, did they? <laughs> they didn't, and they knew. That was their jab at me because they knew that card just pissed me off. Because you know, we need a better card, right? This damn thing. Oh, but anyway, so, so that was one area where I struggled uh, on my team. Uh, my pilot, the first time I was commander, really, really great guy, gifted pilot. But the same thing, he was a little behind, and so he could do things. And then when you're the pilot, so you have a pilot and you have a commander. The commander really does the most of the piloting, and the pilot's the cool pilot. But the, but the pilot has the hydraulic systems, the auxiliary power units, the flight control systems. Uh, so his systems can kill you faster than anything. So with my pilot, he was struggling. 
And I did, you know, I sat down with him and just said, hey, look, and he was, he was very religious and did a lot with his church and had faith uh, and got to the point where I said, hey, <clears throat> you're going to have to put more time in on Sundays. You need to sit down and write up cue cards for you so that you know this stuff cold. And, you know, and uh, uh, sadly, we lost him. He was the commander of Columbia. And uh, his wife, I'm on the Challenger Center Board of Directors <clears throat> because we lost Challenger first and then Columbia. Challenger in 86 and then in 2003, Columbia. His wife is an amazing lady. And she, you know, I see her. Uh, up on this board because their daughter is on this board uh, as well and she comes up and says you know rick same thing right she, he he in and he would tell her and she later told me really really appreciated me sitting down and going hey we need to do a little bit better and she also said he was kind of devastated he, it was it really hit him hard when i grabbed him and said hey we're not getting there that you know he really wanted to please me, uh, which, which actually makes me feel really good. Uh, and by the way, he got there, and, and he did so well that he got selected to be a commander on his second flight. He was the first pilot that NASA had selected to be a commander on their second flight. They hadn't done that in about 15 years. Wow. It, it, Rick, you, you know, so, so I felt really good. Uh, that he got selected to be a commander on the second flight because he had performed so well. And, uh, but, but anyway, I guess, and that's the hard part of being a leader, being a teacher, is sometimes you, you, you really do need to be somewhat brutally honest if your approaches up until then haven't worked. And, and when I can, I try to, Try to be considerate of getting them there such that hey, they're motivated without finally being going, oh man, I'm in trouble, or, or feeling bad about themselves or feeling bad about their performance. Uh, but, but sometimes it's, you know, it's, you, we need to be brutally honest. So mm -hmm. that's, that's outstanding. Um, first time you got on the rocket and taken off was that enough speed for you it was it was great no i, I still think the shuttle is underpowered the, uh, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but, but it was a it was a really neat experience yeah i'm sure um kind of last formal question if you will can you share a time when you know maybe people around you were not very confident maybe there was a challenge there was a problem and it was because of your skills and your confidence, leadership ability, and training, that you really rallied the team and were able to, you know, pull things together that could have really gone south in some way. And and uh, you have an example like that you could share? Yeah, yeah. So when we lost Space Shuttle Columbia, I was airborne at Kennedy Space Center to rendezvous with the space shuttle as it comes in. So we're kind of in opposite circles. So were you in a, are you just in a plane or were you? In a plane, yeah. Okay, so you were rendezvousing at them when they were coming back. Yeah, so in, NASA has some business jets, they're Gulfstreams, uh, so Gulfstream 2, in fact, and they're, they're called a shuttle training aircraft. The left side, or the right side of the cockpit is a Gulfstream 2. The left seat is a space shuttle. So and there's a bank of computers in it, so to train to fly the space shuttle, we, we would go with an instructor in the right seat who would fly the, uh, sta the, we call it STA for shuttle training aircraft, STA, up to about 35,000 feet overhead the field, engage the fly-by-wire space shuttle, and now it flies like a space shuttle. And now the left seat has it with the hand controller that's in the, in the space shuttle. And so when the space shuttle comes back, as it's rolling out on final at around 16,000 feet, we're coming in from the other direction and rendezvousing with it. And then we follow it down the path and we're gathering the environmental data. So if there's the wind shears, the, the wind direction, if there's any thermals, 
we gather that data and then we back it out to compare uh, how well the systems on the space shuttle reacted. Or if there was something strange, we had that data so we could learn from it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we, you know, by the time Columbia was supposed to show up, we knew there was a problem because there was no communication. Uh, Columbia didn't show up, uh, which was really, you know, devastating. I'm supposed to land at a runway about six, seven miles away. They have a helicopter position to take me to the, to the, the field. I know the families are at the field, the shuttle landing facility. Mm -hmm. So with Houston, when they said, hey, you know what? You need to go on land. Columbia is not showing up. And, then, and I did say, I said, well, can I land at the shuttle landing facility? And they came back and they go, no, right? I mean, they didn't want to change procedures. So my, my interest was to get back to the families. Um, so I did get back there pretty quickly. It was a tough time with the families, uh, with the spouses. We're, we're a very tight knit family. Uh, we then got on the airplane and headed back to Houston. And I called an all hands meeting for the astronaut office. And because when we lost Columbia, it came down in Eastern Texas. So it came down not all that far from Houston. And I had a couple astronauts uh, who had their own airplanes and they were getting ready to go launch and their own search party because nobody was doing anything, you know, kind of, they, they were obviously everybody's pretty emotional. Sure. And when I heard, of, heard about that, and uh, my deputy was back there and he kind of reeled them in. I said, no, 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 all hands, right? Every astronaut, was in the office, in a, I forget what time it was we got back, but it was around seven or eight at night. Yeah, and I rallied them all, right? And, and uh, it was a tough time. And I just pulled on strength and said, hey, look, here's what I know. Here's what I don't know that we'll find out, but we are not going to go out and jump on our own planes and start a search. We are not going to do anything out of the ordinary. What we are going to do is make sure we support things that are flowed down to us. And if you have great ideas and suggestions, super, you bring it up to me. But, but you know, I, I kind of said, uh, and so what was so fascinating was our office size was 100-ish, a little over 100. Over half of the astronaut office had never flown. And that first meeting, uh, and by the way, I set up a series of meetings, so every three or four weeks we we came in in the evening and spent time working through where we were, what should we do. Uh, the most emotional were the more experienced. So my most experienced astronauts that have been there the longest, longer than me, were, were kind of, it's a death trap, we should never climb on it again, yeah, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, in that meeting too, one astronaut who, who later commanded a mission was like, yeah, I don't think I'm flying it again. But obviously. Those were the emotions. The younger group, astronauts, their whole attitude was, hey, we don't care. Just don't do anything to take away our opportunity, right? We don't care if it blows up. We want an opportunity to climb on it. So I had this huge dichotomy. <laughs> and, uh, That's a big swing. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And so we spent time, and uh, I put together a, a position paper from the astronaut office that says, hey, here's what we think we should do. And what we got to was, you know, as a group, and we started having these meetings every several weeks, that say, hey, so what should we do, right? And, and I actually, I asked the questions. I rarely said, here's what we should do. But where it went was exactly where I think it should have gone. And that's, hey, we have international obligations to build the International Space Station. You know, so we had five partners the US, Russia, Europe, Canada, and Japan, the space station dies without us. It dies without the space shuttle. We have to figure out what went wrong, climb back on that horse, build the space station. We also know statistically that the odds, when you climb on a space shuttle, you know, we flew it 135 times, we lost two. So your odds are not good. And at that time, we'd flown 113. So the odds were like one in 67. You're not coming back. You're going to die one out of 67 times. Uh, when I flew in combat, I flew in Desert Storm off the USS Nimitz. My chances of being killed on a flight were one in 20,000. 
So compared to any other thing, there, there's not a job that's more risky than climbing on the space shuttle. And the reason is it doesn't have crew escape. Uh, even the older Apollo, Mercury, Gemini all had crew escape. The shuttle didn't. It was so sophisticated as a winged vehicle, it was hard to figure out how to do it. So it was never done. So as an office, we go, hey, we got a complete station. We need to build out station. That should take 25 or so more flights. The odds of losing a crew, another crew in those 25 flights are in our favor. Because, you know, they're one in 67. So anyway, the real simple math for everybody to understand is 25, that's worth the risk. We can do that. Uh, but we have to know if the space shuttle is damaged like it was on Columbia, which we didn't know. So we, we did get those kinds of inspection techniques and resources. But what we really need is a spaceship that will take us back to the moon and onto Mars. And the space shuttle can't do that. It was never designed to do that. So we need the replacement put in work today. And we need to continue flying the shuttle to build out station. And then the transition that we worked out was about a year of no vehicle for astronauts to fly. We'll transition to an exploration vehicle that will take us beyond low Earth orbit, and it'll have to crew escape. So I wrote this white paper up, and, and I intentionally did not go tell my boss, because I knew he would tell headquarters, and I knew headquarters then would want it to be their paper, right? And then I'd be forced with this, this problem of headquarters telling me what my paper was going to say. So I just didn't do that. And uh, I showed up to my boss and said, hey, here's a astronaut white paper. By the way, he was an astronaut. He just owned the astronaut office and owned all the airplanes NASA had at our, our Ellington field. So the 747 that hauls them around, we have some B-57s that do recon, reconnaissance and, and research. He, he, he said, hey, Rama, I would sure like to have seen this paper before you signed it. I said, I know. And I said, Bob, you know, this isn't Kent Rominger's white paper. It's not intended to be Bob Cabana's white paper. This is the astronaut office. And we spent a lot of hours pulling together what we, the astronaut office, thought. He goes, well, can I change it? I said, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Right? You can do whatever you want. To me, it was important. I signed a paper that said, this is what the astronaut office says. It's not what Kim Romero thinks, although it was very aligned, right? And so, so he appreciated that. He read it. He, he actually liked it. He goes, hey, you know what? I'm good with this. And what's interesting is before I ever gave it to him, it had obviously leaked because the NASA headquarters <laughs> rolled out their plan and is exactly what our white paper detailed. So, so, so anyway, it leaked out, but, but I felt really good about, I rallied the troops. Uh, it was painful, right? I mean, we're, we're the, our family, we lost seven of our own. Sure. We had families that we were taking care of. Uh, I came out, one of them, she loves Zion National Park, Indian. Uh, Indian heritage and American, obviously, by the time she flew, but her her folks had flown in from in India. I came into Zion. I, I flew in, and we spread her ashes in Zion National Park. Oh, wow. But anyway, it, so, so it was very personal. But I look back, and I feel really good about uh, how I led us through a very difficult time. Uh, it was not fun. I, I kind of turned into somewhat of a machine, but I was able to control my emotions. Uh, I, four days, actually three days after we lost Columbia, we had a ceremony at Houston. President Bush Jr. flew in for it. So I gave the eulogy for the crew. And uh, before I, I was actually on stage, you know, with the whole center and nationally televised, I had never made it through that eulogy without breaking down into tears. But it was kind of the, the same thing where I, when I was up there on stage, I had the families that right there in front of me. I, ju I just had the strength to deliver, and I'm not a good speaker, but for me, I, I delivered it to a standard that 
I was, you know, was hoping I would give it to and knock it down because uh, that because that strength. Uh, but anyway, so that's kind of a sad note. But but ironically, you know, I feel good about how we recovered uh, through there. So, anyway, well, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, so kind of my last formal question is, is, as a message to someone who maybe feels like they don't have confidence or they not sure if they can do something or they maybe they feel like they can't, what would a message be that you would give to that person? Yeah, my message is you just go try, right? It takes a, a bigger person to try at something when they know hey, it's probably not going to work out all that well or they're going to be, a, you know, in their minds, there'll be a failure or it might be embarrassing because you're not going to fully do. You are such a bigger person than that one that knows, hey, you know what, I, I, can, I should be able to go into this and do well. I, I know I'm going to do well. It takes a much bigger person to enter something like that where they know, hey, you know, it's going to be embarrassing because I'm going to get my tail kicked. If you do that and demonstrate that you can do that, you are such a big person. And people recognize that, right? They, they probably won't come up to you and go, hey, that was awesome. But, you know, when I was, uh, when I was running track to, I sucked at uh, distance and track coach came up to me and <laughs> That said, put his arm around me. Goes, hey, you know what? You you work hard on anybody out here. Don't get down on yourself. Uh, keep it up. You know, I eventually did. You know, uh, I I got to where I I did. Could run a five minute mile sort of thing, which was nothing great, but it wasn't nearly. I was I just, just when I started, I just sucked. I was so bad. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he goes, hey, stick with it. And it, there was nothing fun about it. I'm not sure why I stuck with it, but I did. And then later on, you know, I, I wound up uh, just being glad I did. I'd stuck with it, just kind of seemed like the right thing to do. And and a couple of people let me know that, hey, you know, we, we kind of acknowledge, one, you suck at this, but two, you're trying, so, so keep trying. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it's really, you know, what's important is, you you go try, right? You try, do your best. Hey man, there's only there's only one person that finishes at the top. All the rest of us finish below there. Learning how to deal with that it is so important. And you know, the people I really admire are those that they just they just throw themselves out there and go for it, whether they have talent or not. And, and they figure out mentally how to deal with it and enjoy it. You won. Right? You won. And you do that. You win. Uh, you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, just a couple minutes ago, self-talk. Telling yourself to go do it. Tell, how, what kind of key do you, how do you perceive that as a key to self-confidence? Or do you? Yeah, no, I absolutely do. And uh, in fact, for me, interestingly, when you land aboard an aircraft carrier, you're graded. Every single time you land on an aircraft carrier, you're given a grade. And they have kind of strange language. It's called OK, fair, or bolter if you missed the wires, or no grade, which is bad, or a cut if it was dangerous. And uh, when you're deployed at sea, that's a big deal. Everybody's grades are posted on a board. When you walk into somebody's ready room, which is where all the pilots, uh, gather you you walk in you look at a greeny board and go okay because green is good yellow is average red is bad you look at it and go hey who's who's doing well who's not um so there's a lot of focus right and if i was in the proper if i were properly focused i could do well and if i weren't i, I didn't do nearly as well and so a lot of times i knew before i ever climbed in the airplane you know what, i'm not focused and, and sure enough, I wouldn't get the grade that I wanted. And so I always try to figure out how to get me out of that. And, and sometimes it's when I was distracted with my ground job or, or I knew, you know, I was 
other distractions that had me not focused on what I was going to go do. Or if I'd had a, a real good run of success, I'd become a little overconfident and just think I had to figure it figured out without trying. And I, uh, and then I know too, I go, oh, yeah, hey, I've been here before. I, I am going to, I'm, I'm overconfident. I'm so confident. I'm, I know I'm not focused. Isn't that weird to know? So I competitively water ski. Same thing. I'll go out and when I drop in the water, I'm going, you know, I, I just am not focused. And, uh, and I'll go out and I won't ski as well as I should. And then that resets me where I'm like, okay, right? So the next time, so the truth is I'm better. You know, I can get more focused. But a lot of times it takes that, that bad set of skiing. It takes that, damn, I didn't, I know I can do better than that. And I didn't do it. Or I'm just going, okay, Kent, let's, let's think about this, right? And so the human brain, right? I, you know, the real answer is I don't know how to really, I wished I could really focus myself. And, you know, like, you look a little Simone Biles. I don't know if you follow the Olympics and gymnastics, but you know yeah, she was pretty amazing. What what an incredible athlete, right? How and uh, my daughter loves following gymnastics. She's twenty five and she's not a gymnast, but she follows it. So matter of fact, last night we watched the uh, one of the first U.S. national gymnastics meets happened a week or so ago. My my daughter recorded it, so we watched it last night, and Simone came back. And she won it, but but she actually had a fall that made it a little closer than it should have been. And when they interviewed her, they uh, and you could see her during the meet. She was just didn't look real happy and content. And uh, when they interviewed her, they said, "Hey, so you know, it, it actually turned out to be a pretty interesting meet." And uh, what were you thinking after the bars? She 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 fell fell off the bars and. Uh, she said, she goes, you know, I knew I could do this in practice. I had it all figured out. And here I didn't perform. So I was annoyed with myself. And she used the word annoyed. So she goes, so I was annoyed with myself, right? So, but but with Simone, you know, that's obviously she's got physical gifts, but mentally, she too, she she pushes herself, she drives herself, she tries to stay focused. But she obviously wasn't as focused on the bars as she could have, should have been. She admitted, hey, the, the whole evening she was more nervous than she thought she was going to be. She was having to deal with the nerves. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, she feels good about how she deals with her nerves. But, but I applaud her for acknowledging, hey, I, I was nervous, right? more so than I thought. And I got annoyed at myself because, you know, I, I know I can do better than that. So... As humans, I think we all battle that. Some of us are better at dealing with it than others. And uh, I know I struggle. I struggle with, particularly if I think, hey, I'm kind of getting this figured out. You know, then that may help me for a little while, but eventually that becomes a little more dominant in my brain than it needs to be, and I get reset. So and I, I, wished I, I wished I had something for you to tell you. Oh. Now, you, you, you've actually, across all genres that I've interviewed and the psychological models, that you've basically hit on the four points through our conversation here of what I'm coining as the personal confidence model. I don't know if that's a real thing, but, you know, you know determining what's possible, outlining the exact steps that you actually have control over, mindfully executing those steps until they're a reflex, and then using positive self-talk and affirmations to bolster your actions. And, and those four things are kind of seem to be universal across everybody. They seem to be universal across the psychological models, and, you know, and stuff like I told you with Dr. Gervais. And this, and so I appreciate you kind of rolling through this with me because through the course of these questions, you said these four things totally in a different way, but that's what you hit on. Um, Unless you would disagree with that. No, I totally agree. I should be looking at the camera. <laughs> but, well, you know, 
One of the things I do fairly well is uh, things that I can't control. I, I tend not to get too hung up on those. And so I can I'm find a space shuttle. People go, hey, weren't you pretty worried on launch that something could go wrong? No. No, I, I was more worried that I would screw something up that I was supposed to do or that the weather or we'd have something mechanically that would prevent us from launching. But I, I, I was never once the least bit nervous on launch. Now, when you come back for landing, uh, I actually thought I'd be really nervous. Uh, I, I wasn't so much, but we manually pilot the space shuttle into a landing the last four and a half minutes. And uh, when I was the pilot, I saw commanders that were really nervous. Uh, so I figured I would be as well, but, but I wasn't. I, I, I'm like, well, I, uh, a little nervous, but things I can't control. Hey, I, you know, I just didn't never get all that worried about it. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, so I want to be respectful of your time. We've been going for a while. Is there anything on Earth that compares to being in space? No, there is not. No, it is. It is phenomenal. You know, you're looking down at our planet. You circle it every ninety minutes. Uh, it's a gorgeous place. Floating, I right? just floating. Where you're, you're just always floating, is uh, initially very surreal. And uh, yeah, so the whole experience is just phenomenal. And uh, okay. you, you know, in my case, I always just felt so blessed and special to be able to do that. You know, to to look back and, and so. Yeah. Uh, Earth. Yeah. How many astronauts are there, like active, at any given time? So the, the number varies widely. When we were flying the space shuttle a lot and building the space station, at one time we had over 150 astronauts in the office. Today, because we don't have a space shuttle, space station, you know, there's six total of which half-ish are Americans. The, the astronaut office size now is down around 40, maybe a, a bit fewer of active. Mm -hmm. Russia, the same numbers probably and then the the Europeans Japanese but you know there are roughly six humans in orbit permanently and they stay for about six months so that tells you we're, we're only flying about 12 humans per year in space when we were flying the space shuttle we would have a crew of seven and we'd fly the space shuttle you know six times per year we'd be flying 42 astronauts so the space shuttle was really a neat opportunity for America to put a lot in space. In uh, total American astronauts, there's that have flown in space. It's it's over 300. So there's quite a few Americans that have flown in space. Has anybody flown more than you? By looking at your resume, at least what I could find online, it seemed like wow, that is a lot. <laughs> so, so I was lucky. I flew five times on the space shuttle. We've had folks that have flown six times and seven times. So yeah, they've flown more times. The station astronauts have way more time in space because on the shuttle, we were shorter duration. The longest flight was just, you know, about 17 plus, almost 18 days. Right. Uh, I, I think I have more hours on the space shuttle than anybody, which is just a Coincidental, my missions were all long. So even though folks flew seven times, I wound up with more hours on the space shuttle. Uh, so, but but the answer is yeah, there, there are folks that are, and in fact, gosh, John Young was one of my heroes. He flew Gemini twice, Apollo twice, and the space shuttle twice. On Apollo, he, he walked on the moon on the Apollo mission. Uh, he was the first commander of the space shuttle, so he flew the very first space shuttle. Uh, and so the experiences that guy has had are phenomenal. And, and he was such a neat guy. And, and Neil Armstrong, too, was one of my absolute, I, I just totally thought the world of Neil. He came a bit, became a bit of a recluse. And actually, the Apollo guys, the moonwalkers, most of them dealt with some serious challenges of depression, alcohol abuse, you know, almost all of them, some more than others, but uh, Neil, he just, 
he handled all that so well. Uh, anyway. There's a new movie about him coming out. I saw previews for. Oh, good. Yeah. It looks like it focused on him. I'm sure others as well, but I uh, can't remember the name of it, but Ryan Gosling starring as, as him. Oh, neat. So I think, oh, yeah. Uh, so it'll be a it'll be a really neat story to watch. And uh yeah. and Gene Cernan too, there was a movie about him, Last Man on the Moon. Uh he he's he's a character. i I really loved being around Gene and he was passionate about inspiring kids, you know, to learn math and science and just do the most that they could. And uh so anyway, those guys got you know, I I don't even come close. To being in the same league as those guys and, and everything they did as the pioneers and going to the moon and anyway uh, that's got to be a coveted uh, very coveted amongst your group to be able to step on the moon <laughs> yeah that, that's what i've always wanted to do i want to go to the moon when they say mars you want to go to mars i go yeah but you know mars that's a two to three year trip <laughs> right. a lot of sacrifice to the, to the, Whereas the moon, you know, the moon's just a few days away. And on the moon, you weigh only a sixth of what you weigh on Earth. On Mars, you weigh three-eighths of what you weigh on Earth. And so you can jump higher on the moon. You know, so anyway, <laughs> at, at the moon, too, you can look back at the Earth and, and see, you know, see the Earth. Right. When you're on Mars, you can look back at the Earth. It's just one of the stars in the sky. I mean, so. Yeah, it's a little uh, discomforting, I think. <laughs> but, so it would be neat to be that explore and if you look at the fun side of it right like you know dog fighting is fun uh you, you're not doing as much for mankind so the fun side of it the moon it would be way a fun playground mars would be really cool to be a part of that and uh, sure. you know, all different motivations but yeah if i was getting the, the choice i'd go to the moon <laughs> you know, I know mars is a much more novel important mission sure have you been on the space station? I have, oh. yeah. So, uh, matter of fact, I was the very first space shuttle that went up to space station was Endeavour in uh, December of '98, and it went up and rendezvoused. The first piece came out of Russia, out of Kazakhstan, on an unmanned rocket. Endeavour launched and took up a piece built in the U.S. a node and attached the two, and it. It rendezvoused with the Russian segment, grappled it with the robotic arm, made it to the node that it had on its docking port, and then undocked. And then I came up next, and so I wasn't the first shuttle, but the Bob Cabana was, the guy that had been my boss before, great guy. And uh, so I went up next, and I was the first one to actually dock, right? So, oh. so I would always make sure he knew, hey, I was the first one to dock, right? You know? Oh, he he really had the premium mission, and I was a younger commander that, and they had to add in a mission because everything was slipping, and they had already assigned all the experienced guys to do stuff. So I was just kind of happened to be in the right place at the right time. But uh, but I've had so much fun with Bob over the years. Going yeah, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, I was the first one to dock with that space station, even though he was he was the guy that got all the attention for this first shuttle. And then I got to go back later, too, when there was a crew on board. We took up a, a, a Canada arm, but a billion-dollar robotic arm and installed it on the station. So it was, it was neat. It was neat going up when there were, you know, comrades that had been off the planet for four months, and we show up and we get to see them in their little home, home in the sky. That's awesome. Uh, last question. Is there a, a cause, a charity mission that you support or – maybe NASA does that if, if the opportunity presents itself some way we can contribute to that for you, you taking your time to do this. Is there? Yeah, yes, there is. So challenger center. So Ch yeah, the challenger center. So the widow of the commander of challenger, June Scobie, now Rogers kind of started this within months after we lost challenger. And so I'm on the board of directors. I was the chairman. I, my, my term uh, expired. So we, we have a new chair. Uh, but we have 43-ish centers around the nation, a couple of them international. And what they do, they're there to inspire the STEM 
uh, activities and we really target middle school. So kind of four, fifth, sixth graders, put them in, let them be an astronaut for part of the, the time, the mission controller for part of the time. Uh, different missions from going to Mars to undersea to looking back at the planet. And it's pretty cool how you see them get, because it's hands-on, right? So it's hands-on. And we ins really inspire them, target children from all over, but certainly underprivileged areas uh, that we bring in. So yeah, so as a matter of fact, if you Google Challenger Center, when you see it, there's a there's an orange button right online with the donate that you can do something with. Hey, and if you do, let me know because I'll make sure I uh, pass on credit back to the to the board. Well, what I'm thinking I'm going to do is is this is this what was originally supposed to be just a little PDF report to help parents and some videos that I made has turned into basically a full blown book. Uh, I'm thinking that at this point, if we launch it and the book does anything, we'll just give 100% of the profits to the Challenger Centers for your time. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, that's the, I, that doesn't mean that we're going to sell a million copies. I mean, just that I'd be willing to do that because the point of this is really not the sale of books. I, it's to help, and right. obviously selling those would be would be fabulous. But Yeah, but... But thank you for what you're doing, right? Making a change in all the lives of these young folks. Well, and probably you're at ages where you can really be an inspiration and change their vector in life. Absolutely. Really, that, that is such an awesome cause. And that's what, you know, Challenger Center too, right? You know, when we're talking about it, and I keep telling folks, hey, there, there's no cost to me that is more important than what we're trying to do at Challenger, right? And we just do our piece, right? And because we're brick and mortar, hands-on, mm -hmm. we don't get to as many kids as we want. And, and we're, we're trying to expand into schools with training on computers, so more virtual uh, with the idea of getting them excited and then those that want more find a brick and mortar center to go come to. But, you know. Do you go out to schools and speak or speak to groups of kids or? I, I do. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm, I, I might ask you at some point to come out, and if you can, great, if you can't, no problem, but I'm sure I could fill a room with a lot of our students and their parents in the schools. <laughs> I, would, I would love to. I'd love to come, come talk to your kids. And, um, that, would be, that would be awesome. I, I'm, you're a national hero, obviously, so I'm sure they'd love to come meet a real live astronaut. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to come do that. Well, Kent, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, we went a little longer than anticipated. I hope I didn't throw off your schedule, but uh, great insight. Uh, I'll uh, give you a copy of all, all this if you want a recorded copy or whatever. I'd be glad to give that to your whatever. Or yeah, so, so I don't think I need a recorded copy, but I'd love to see your, your book and product when you finish it up. Okay, which, yeah, absolutely. Which I imagine will take a while, won't it? Um, it's mostly done. You're kind of the last person. Oh, wow. Good. I have, I have a few other people that I thought about. Uh, and, uh, the one thing I realized I don't have in this book and I, I still might is I, everybody I've interviewed have been men. So I, uh, I'm going to maybe go try and find a female Olympic athlete or someone maybe that's local, uh, see if I can find a, a, a female perspective on this. Cause I feel like I kind of missed that. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. The, uh, gosh. Yeah. You should be. Uh, so other than that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'll definitely keep you uh, updated and, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep you posted for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, if you'd be willing to come out and speak to a group of kids, I'll, I'll fill a big room for you. I'm sure they'd love to. Love yeah. to you. Just let, know, let me know when to come. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate your generosity with your time. I hope you have a great weekend, and uh, thank you for your service to our country. Hey, you're very welcome. I really enjoyed and thank you for what you're doing, but I look forward to seeing your book and meeting your kids. All right. Thanks, Kent. You have a wonderful day. You too.